I get excited, but I don't get nervous. I don't feel insecure. And if I do feel insecure, that's some, I try to put a stop to it so that I can figure out what that is so that I don't. I think you gotta have a dream. The school of greatness. Really? <laughs> yeah. Please welcome Lewis House. What has been the, the best way for you to connect with people, specifically growing up, uh, you know, being adopted and kind of in the South, I had Twitch on as well. He was like, you know, you couldn't dance in the South in Alabama. No. He's like, you're not accepted as a guy. No. Dancing, singing, bro, doing these things. How did you overcome that? In, that well, and he was he was in Montgomery too. To yeah. Totally, like, I mean, so much of there's so much civil rights history all over Alabama, uh, as you can imagine. Right, uh -huh. like it's all over the place. But I grew up in a football town outside of Birmingham called Trustful, and one of the only people of color. You know, I was like the only mixed kid in my school. Really? Yeah, it was not that we. we five or six black kids, mm -hmm. everyone, it, it was white. I lived in a white football town and I was a gymnast. Right, and you didn't I play football, did you? No, and then I fell in love with theater uh -huh. and dance and music. Like, me in this town with the things that I loved to do and my passion <laughs> was forcing that, that square peg through the uh -huh. circle hole and it just wasn't going, like it just wasn't gonna, it wasn't gonna, ever be right or feel like the right place for me to be. Were you ever accepted in school doing those activities and passions? Th through success. Right. I think. Like the like talent show then The fact like that I would get up and sing and I was good and kids would be like, what? That, that then I was accepted. accepted then. Interesting. Had I not been, but it'd still be something that I'm really passionate about, it wouldn't have been received the same way subsequently wouldn't have been treated the same way. Right. Which is really interesting. How like were you, I, I, how I, remember, you I remember a shift when like all of a sudden every teacher in the school knew who I was and all of them loved me and all of them were like, Jordan! And I was like, <laughs> like okay, this is interesting. How you old know? were you then? I was, I was fifth grade. I was like, okay. that, was, that was the beginning of my love for art was fifth grade. Really great drama program. That was that was the beginning of that, but it was from that year. It was January of, of my fifth grade year to December of my sixth grade year, which would have been you know just that one mm -hmm. that twelve month period. Everyone went, started to see you in differently, completely. Is from, it because you were performing in front of the school, or were you getting uh, notoriety outside? Kind of, of kind of attention? all over the place. Like it was you know it's it started with that school play at the beginning of the year. By the end of the year, I was in middle school. And I had joined a professional theater company, started working professionally, started really? training with Broadway professionals over that summer. And at the beginning of that fall, by the time we got to the fall musical at the school. And you performed, it was like. People were like, what is this? Because there was this, this amazing program in Birmingham, Alabama. Gonna blast it out right now. Red Mountain Theater Company, Birmingham, Alabama. You, there's nothing like this company. I, you would never imagine in Birmingham, Alabama, mm. would there be the most opportunity to genuinely learn under masters of their craft. Broadway, mm. Broadway phenoms and directors and choreographers come wow. down and teach and, and, and train. And that was my, that was my school. That was my school. What was the three biggest lessons you learned from that? summer experience or that program. It was that summer that I was like, this is this is what I want. Really? Do. This, I, I just love this. Like, this is it, this is what I want. And then I auditioned for The Lion King on Broadway and it, I got down to the bottom two. This all happened in one summer, dude. This You're like 11. Like, I, yeah. That's crazy. Brand new to it all. So anyway, Period. So, so if you're, dipping, so you're, <laughs> you're at home with your mom and dad, were uh -huh. you ever, you know, acting or performing or dancing or singing with them until this time? I was like performative, but not really. Like we would sing in the car. I would, you know, apparently I was tone deaf. Apparently I really wasn't a good, ask my folks. So they never, they were never ask like, my friends, you're incredible, bro. let's no, get you in there. No, no, as a matter of fact, I wanted to go on Star Search. David Archuleta was on Star Search and I, I it was such a fan of his. I was like, oh my gosh, he's doing the thing. I was like, I wanna go on Star Search. My folks were like. You're not that good. No. And then all of a sudden, dude, they, they came, said, wait, did they, they say you're not that the, good? They, 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 they asked me, they're like, do you think that if you went on, you would beat David? <laughs> and I would go, no. Like, well, then why would you want to, oh you know gosh. what I mean? Like, I was, dude, I could not sing. Come on, man. How? I'm, I'm, I don't know what else to tell you're you. You're so talented. 
I mean, so we'll thank Mr. Byers in fifth grade, I guess. I'm a music teacher. I don't know what happened. Because to me, always sounded the same. Singing Whitney Houston, always sounded the same. Like, I didn't, I thought that I sounded fine. So it blew my mind when people were like, oh, you really weren't good, Jay. Yeah. Like, you weren't good, and then all of a sudden, you were. It was miraculous like that, like genuinely. <laughs> we can, I can, I mean, I can, I can call like five people on the phone right now and they'll tell you I mean, the you exact have same some story. Type of decent, you couldn't be horrible. I, mean, the, like, I think that there, there was a creative side. I, I watched a lot of movie, I listened to film, TV, uh -huh. listened to a lot of music growing up and had a lot of opportunity to soak in art because I definitely had an affinity for it. So like, oh, I, right. I, you enjoyed it, you appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, like I, I knew what it was and I appreciated it in ways that my, like I would have been just as happy to sit at home and watch movies as a kid when my other friends like wanted to go out and do things. Like I'm happy to go out and play, but like I also really love just diving into a story that a bunch mm. of people worked their off to build and sure. put together. That's so fulfilling to me. And by the end of the film, I feel good. I have a new story in my head. Yeah, my yeah. imagination has expanded and I feel fulfilled in that way. And I think empowering kids to do whatever feels good to them in that way is, is so important. Obviously balance is really great, but. Right, right. So your parents never so, like pushed you into this. They no, were not God, like, okay, no. you've got this little talent. Let's mm -mm. put him into classes and things. You were just curious about it. You were, yep. you thought you were so-so and then you started doing more of it. I did, I did School of Rock, January of fifth grade. The week later, drama club teacher called my parents. Hey, there's a community theater. The Levitt Jewish Community Center is doing the Velveteen Rabbit. I told the director about you. She loved to hear you sing. Uh -huh. If you want to do your first community show, went and did it. Somebody that worked at Red Mountain Theater Company came to see it. I got a standing ovation during my solo every night. That's I played cool. a skin horse. I played right. like a toy <laughs> horse with a big head. Sure. And just, you know, high little alto voice, just wailing, you know, just belting, no dynamics, but just like I was this Going for it, tiny man. little, you know, chocolate boy on a stage with a with a big voice. And we were approached by somebody at Red Mountain was like, we know just the place for you. So this mm, happened just like that. Gosh, it was really within like, a year. Just kind within of, six months. That's Janu crazy. January to June. I did my first school play, community theater show. And then did the, the intensive for Red Mountain. And then that, that was kind of the ball that got everything started. It's also where I met my wife. Wow. When was the time you were on stage where you felt the most unprepared or insecure? Okay. I'm gonna tell you a story I've never told anyone um, because I pride myself on always being prepared. <laughs> <laughs> I did a musical one time in it was, a, it was a holiday season. This was me really like pushing my limits. I don't know how it ended up working out this way, but I ended up doing five Christmas shows at the same time. I was homeschooled, so that's helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but I was, I was doing a show at Red Mountain. I was doing a show at Children's Theater downtown. I was doing a show at ACTA. I was doing a show at the middle school that I was just helping out mm. with. I was doing a show at, at my church. I was doing uh, five Christmas shows. The only one that I was really prepared for was the Red Mountain one because that was that, that was my place. That was, place. The theater, that was, that was my the church. Place. That yeah, was yeah. my temple. That of was course. my everything. My world where all of my friends were. That was my school. That was my community. My extracurricular. Everything that it was Red Mountain. Like that was it. Everything else like took back took a back seat. All of a sudden, we were two nights out from opening one of those Christmas shows, and I knew half of my material. Two nights away, S still wasn't off book. Wow. We opened, <laughs> we got through all of the shows, never got notes. I don't know how I survived. I'm sure that I skipped things. Uh -huh. I'm sure, I don't even know. It, wow. was, it was also so long ago. I mean, that was, that, was, that, was, that was 16 years ago, 15 years ago. Wow. Um, yeah, that was, it was a minute ago, but it was, uh, it was a good learning lesson and, and definitely grounds for like that recurring nightmare of mm -hmm showing up every actor has that nightmare right like do you have ever insecurity before you go on stage or perform at a, a small show a big show a, you know whatever do you ever get insecure no never no no because this is what i do yeah but there's pros who get nervous before big games or in the super bowl or whatever it might be you know you i saw you perform at the world series yeah. and i'm sure those athletes are nervous even though they do this every day yeah um how did you develop that type of confidence in yourself to just show up and deliver. Recognition that preparation is the answer. Mm -hmm. That's that's how I that's how you beat that. 
if you're prepared, what what is there to worry about truly? I guess it's a form of Taoism in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, you have an issue. You don't have an issue. These are, this is the picture. We'll start we'll start with this tree. You have, do you have an issue? If the answer is yes, then don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Right? If, oh, sorry. If you if you have an issue, don't worry about it. If you have an issue, the answer is yes. The next question is, can you do something about it? If that answer is yes, don't worry about it. Then don't worry about it. Just do it. If the answer is no, you can't do anything about it. Then don't worry about it because mm -hmm. you can't do anything about it. Right. If it's your craft, if it's your work, if it's like the thing that you're meant to do, contracted to do, expected to do, you should probably prepare to do it mm -hmm. before you go. <laughs> right. How often, what's your preparation look like then before you take on a new Broadway show or? Yeah, it depends on the project and it depends on the amount of material. So mm -hmm. like Evan Hansen, for example, the character doesn't leave the stage. It's a two and a half hour long musical and it's just so many pages of material, so much music. I, before we got into rehearsals for a month, was studying my script and mm -hmm. and getting as prepared and as off book as possible so that when there's right. a reference for a scene that the director says, like, I haven't worked with this company before, I haven't worked with this cast before, I haven't done anything like that. I don't, you know, I've worked with the director before, but on a totally different show and, mm -hmm. you know, at a lot down the street here at Fox, but not not for his Broadway baby, his, mm. like, you know, so I don't know what the process is gonna be like and it's a super emotional, yeah. super intense show. Why don't I just do myself a favor? <laughs> Prepare as much as possible, yeah. Since I really don't know what mm. variables are gonna come and just prepare for as much as I can yeah. and recognize that once I have prepared, then it's just a matter of going and doing it. To the best you can, To yeah. the absolute best of your ability, like, mm. and, and, and I mean like truly to the absolute best of your ability go and do it mm -hmm. that's it and so like yeah pre-anthem you read the game i was happy my i, I had a couple of friends up there I was chilling i i've sung the anthem so many times it is sure. the most nerve-wracking song to sing the only thing that i ever worry about when performing the national anthem regardless of the audience's concern is don't say ramparts first because if you say ramparts first you're stuck and over. You can't gotcha. say ramparts first. <laughs> um, and that's it's a common mix up. And then there's no way to repair. That's the only thing. It's like once you get past the first two lines, you're, you're fine. Yeah, it's automatic. You're set. So no, I get, I get excited, but I don't get nervous. I don't feel insecure. Mm. And if I do feel insecure, that's some, I try to put a stop to it so that I can figure out what that is so that I don't go into the performance insecure. Do you ever... Uh, feel afraid of like how people will think or judge your performance ever or what they'll say or if they didn't like yeah. it or if they compare you to someone else or anything like that I guess like if you know if it's like a controversial topic or something mm. like you know do you, it's probably normal to be fearful of what like the general public might think because mm -hmm. if you're taking on a controversial topic your goal is to probably turn it on its head right and give mm -hmm. people perspective sure, and sure, sure. Be restorative in some way Interesting. I guess the reason I ask you this is because I've met so many incredibly talented people in mm. sports or in business, afraid to go to the next level, afraid to put their message out there, whether it be a book or some project or, or, or whatever it might be, their expression into the world. Yeah. But they are so talented. I'm like, give me a percentage of that talent. Mm -hmm. The fear kind of cripples them. Yeah. What people, uh, the fear of judgment, the fear of success, the fear of failure. Do you not have any of those fears? I here's the thing. We just we just met, right? Yeah. And when I walked in, I, I, met, a, I met somebody I had not met before. I met a stranger. Right. You probably had a first impression of me. I don't know what that first impression was. I'm not going to ask you. Whatever that first impression was, I cannot change it. Right. I do not have the ability to do that. Mm -hmm. Would it be cool to? Yeah, sure. Sometimes, maybe. That's like playing with that's playing with time, and uh -huh. like Doctor Strange will come in and and put a stop to it all, but. I can't change the way that you looked at me or how you felt when you shook my hand or if you thought initially like, you know, maybe he's you, maybe he's not as nice as I hear or whatever. Like, I don't know what that is or what you're going to think of me when we leave the place, but hopefully it's good. And if mm -hmm. it's not, I mean, I can't change it. And if it's good, I'm sure I could do something to change it, but I would have to be intentional about <laughs> right, that, you right, know what I mean? Right. And so since I'm just being intentional about the art, yeah. And I'm doing what feels good to me, and I'm doing what feels good for, for, for the piece, 
um, and doing what, what feels good for the project, for the character, whatever that case may be, then that's why I do it. I don't do it to see what people might think about it. Of course. It. Have you always felt that way or thought about yourself in that way? Because a lot of people don't think that way. I think that I have treated my career like a business from the moment I started. It's never bled into my personal life. So mm -hmm. I just, I, I really just try hard to not take it personally. Like, wow. Of course, there are things that you do take personally, like not being casted because of the color of your skin and then mm -hmm. like... Things like that, you know, lack of opportunity for all sorts of mm -hmm. people, people sure. of color, LGBTQ+, plus, et cetera. It's, it's um, you know, the Asian American community, Asian community in general, Latinx, et cetera. There's, there's, mm -hmm. so, mu there's so many things that, like, could, like that, that could be hurtful and really put me out, but, like, we're evolving in those ways. Where it comes to the art, that's what I do. Yeah. It's inspiring, man. That's what I do. Like you can, you can think whatever you think, and if you choose to write about it, that is entirely your prerogative. Mm. But like, I'm gonna put it out. It's amazing that you don't allow any of that to distract you from your mission of sharing your expression mm -hmm. with each project the way you intend to share it. So that's really inspiring. And I think a lot of people struggle with that. Yeah, that's also not You're... my sole mission in my life. My sole mission in my life is to be a good dad. Right. That's, that's it. Like, I go to work. This is me working right now. This is like just what I'm doing today. Sure. And it's great. And it's cool because it's dynamic and I love it. I love all of the things that I get to do. It's, you know, I have a lot of fun on my day to day. I've got a really big team, really great assistant, really great cool things that I get to do. Yeah, yeah, get to like swing like all over the jungle uh -huh. gym of the entertainment industry. And then like, you know, the, the, the bell goes off and, the, and the, the, the street lamps come on and it's time to go home and have dinner. Wow. I don't think many people in the industry think that way. Though. Yeah, no. I don't know. Maybe maybe they do, but I haven't really seen. I think that, that a lot of people rom romanticize it, but I think a lot of people are so wrapped up with wanting more. Where I'm happy where I'm at. You don't need to take on more things no. if you don't want to. No, I love my pace. I love my level of like. I hate the term fame because I don't like the celebrity part of mm -hmm. everything that we do. But I. I like my... That you're famous, but you're not that famous. Yeah, like, I can still go to the grocery store. People might ask for a picture or be uh -huh. like... Yeah, they yeah. Might do, but they're not, for the most part, depends on where I'm at. If I'm at a Disney park or something, yeah, it's a course, different, different situation. If I'm at a, if I'm at a, you know, Olivia Rodrigo concert in Texas, it's going to be a different situation. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's specific. But, yeah, I, I think that so many people are so wrapped up with when am I going to be satisfied? Mm. Where... I found my satisfaction in my family and in my love wow, and man. in my relationships with my friends That's and in beautiful. my home. Have you had that your whole life or was that after a period of time of being in LA and realizing like, Oh yeah, dude, no, I was, I, was, I was 16, 17 in LA and working and like had a good car and like right. was bouncing around and doing the thing, finding myself, dude. I really? I was a kid. Was when did just, you feel like you found who you were or wanted to be? What year was that? I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds like you are have this reflection where you're like, you know, family is the key where I'm at right now. and That yeah. was always. Interesting. Always loved my family. I have, a, I, have a, I have a crazy family life and family history and stuff, but like the core is my mom and my dad and me and my little brother. And all three of them are gonna come to my hotel tonight after this podcast. They're gonna come, we're gonna have some drinks, we're gonna hang, we're gonna eat, get in the pool, chill go for a stroll on the beach. I got a couple other friends that my family's really close to. They'll nice. come over like a little bit later and hang with all of us. That's and, great, like, man. Because they all know that that's what fills me. Mm. And I know that that's what fills me. That's beautiful. Where I have so many friends that would get here. They would land, they would go to their hotel. They drop their stuff, they you know, freshen up and they would go to the first function they could find. The industry event, yeah. And I... <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, stop, stop, wait, <laughs> stop, listen, because the thing is, is that like, you have to for mm -hmm. a while. If you are trying to build yourself up here, yeah, you've got to show, you have to, you got to do the rounds, you got to do the meetings, you, you got to, let's go somewhere, shoot some really ironic photos of each other and put them on Instagram and like get our likes and make our TikTok videos and do the things. And it's like, yeah, sure. Do it. All of it. It's all great and wonderful. I don't have the energy anymore. 
I don't have the time. You've also now, been doing this since you were, you know, 11, 12, yeah, 13. Yeah, it's 10. I've been doing it for 18 years yeah. professionally. Yeah. yeah. And you've got to, but you kind of, you've made it to a certain level of uh, notoriety and opportunities and, you know, financial sure. abundance. Yeah. Where maybe others are trying to get to that. Place. Right, 100%. So they got to build. 100%. Yeah, yeah. And, and the thing that I love to talk about is that, like, it never happens overnight, right? Like, when, yeah. when, when, when I did Grease Live for Fox, I don't even remember what year that was. It would have been like 20, let's see, I joined Hamilton fall of 2016. So it would have been, we would have rehearsed November of 2015. So was 2016. With, was that with the Julianne Huff? Yeah, it was with Julianne oh, Huff yeah, and Aaron yeah. So yeah, January yeah. 16th, sorry, J- January 2016. So Grease Live happened and I got the, it. There was a moment. Uh-huh. There was a moment. I played Duty. I sang one song on the show. I did not, no one expected, I did not expect for the world to care mm. about duty. Also, frankly, I didn't want to do it in the first place. My, my agent had to convince me to do it because they're all hate watches. And as a Broadway person, as a theater person, as a fan, I, I want to give those shows a fair shot. Mm. And it's so hard because I know that so, many, so much of the world watches those shows to play drinking games and to mm-hmm. poke fun and all of those things. And my agent was like, you, I need you to do to like, to trust me in this. Like, you know, it's a great team. And I knew the team obviously I was dying to work with the creative team. Tommy Kale is a big fan of, he directed in the Heights and, and Hamilton was obviously like gaining momentum in a mm-hmm. big, big way and had just opened, et cetera. And it, I was like, okay, like I'm gonna give it a shot. I'm gonna do it, and then it happened to be the best scenario. It happened to be the best live musical that we had done. Of course, I did Rent years later, and it was like it was a moment. But sure. <laughs> they happen, and you learn. And like you know, I wasn't hurt by that at all. I was just upset for for our our castmate that broke his foot. Mm. You know, that was an interesting thing. But I had that 15 minutes, dude. I had that 15 minutes, and all of a sudden, I felt I felt it. I felt for the first time the how quickly. The industry goes, <laughs> you're next. Really? Yeah. So you've been working for 13, 14 years at that point. Yeah. And then that one moment, what happened? It was an overnight, like a all of a sudden because of this one song that I sang in the show, the yeah. world was like, what? And I still don't really understand the magic of that moment, but it happened and I don't take it back. I don't What happened? Questions. What happened after that? You mean Phone people kind of up. anointed you as like, you're I, the- my phone wouldn't work. <laughs> like I, I came back into my dressing room at the end of the show and somebody that I passed by was like, dude, just so you know, Twitter's freaking out. Really? And your phone's probably blowing up. Get home. Because it was live you. live. It was live live. Yeah. And I had no clue. And I went and I looked at my phone and it was, I just turned it off. It freaked me out. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know why, you know, I knew it was good. It was good reviews and stuff, but like I didn't know ultimately what had happened. And that was like, that was the mile marker that where, where my career really began. Isn't that interesting? It takes 15, 10, 15 years until, okay, now you've put in enough reps, enough projects, and enough it's a, things. And the industry then was like, oh, this new kid. <laughs> You're like, hey, I've been doing this since I was 10. Yeah. <laughs> like, Hi guys. <laughs> Well, hey, yeah. good to see you all again. It's it's. <laughs> You're like I met you six years ago. Yeah, when I did the round. Here and we are ago. again. Now we're interested. Totally fine. Mm-hmm. I, that's just the cycle of this industry, dude. Mm-hmm. If you take it personally, it will become corrosive. Yeah. You cannot take it personally. You just have to do the work and recognize that it's going to be your time when your time is right. Right. Period. And not try to rush it. No. Except when you get casted or don't Soak get casted. Soak up the moments where you're not the talk of the town. Soak up Why? those moments because, like, when you are, you quickly don't want to be anymore. It's great for the work, but like, it's exhausting. It's exhausting. It's exhaustive work. What's the most exhausting part of being the talk of the town for a season or years or the moment? This is probably my anxiety talking, but uh, the worship culture of how you're the greatest, you're the, the best. Celebrity, you're the celebrity worship culture is is not talked about enough. It's mm. just not. Because no one actually knows who you who you no. were. I mean, some people might have known who you were, but no one actually knew you. They right. saw a performance. Yeah. They saw a talent expressed mm-hmm. in a beautifully artistic way that touched people's heart, soul, minds, made them feel something. 
it was a few minutes song. It wasn't like they yeah. knew your whole life story or they right. were friends with you or connected but with you. But for some reason, all of a sudden, mob mentality, whatever the case may be, mm-hmm. everyone decided that I was it for the minute. Wow. You know? And then it fades away. How long does that last? It's, until a, it's a 15 minute window, dude. It's like a, it's like six a, it's months, a, a year. Cycle, yeah, maybe. six months, a year of like strike the iron while it's hot. I did an interesting thing. I the huh. the TV iron was striking. It was hot. I was getting offers for some really great shows for television. But I had I had been working on Disney Channel for a while and been doing TV films and stuff like featurettes and things like that, commercials. I was really I was signed to a record label and really ready to start giving my music a fair shot. Uh-huh. And was met at a at a crossroads and needed to decide like okay this thing that I've been working ten years oh, to become man. successful and or this thing that I've you know been signed for a year and I now have a record that I can put out and it's going to chart and we can go. If I don't do this now, I don't know when I'll ever be able to really start my music career. Wow. And I was young and single and ready to be on a radio tour and could be on a radio tour. Nine month grueling, going to 120 different radio stations. You're playing multiple shows a day in different cities, two, three flights a day. Just building up. Never home. It is, it is woo, it is a moment. It's how, a moment. How old are you then? I would have been, I would have been like 20, 21. You weren't in the relationship at the time? 21, 21, 22. You're single meaning not married or you weren't? Sing, single meaning not in a relationship not at relationship, all. Like yeah. I had no, I had a, I had a pug. <laughs> yeah. That was my commitment. That's a big commitment. That was my, yeah, yeah. But he was my, that's my, yeah. that was my boy. So you had this season of life where you're like, okay, here's these two crossroads essentially. Yeah. Go all in on the TV stuff or right. or say no to what potentially every actor wants out here mm-hmm. is this opportunity to do all these things yeah. and go all in on the music. And it's interesting that we're having this conversation right now too. So I'd love to like, I'm going to come back at some point in time. We can like have a good of catch course. up. We should, we, should, we should do this like once a year absolutely unpack um, it unpack it man the the interesting thing in that is that when I made that decision and committed to that decision I'm, we're gonna say no to all these TV offers man painful 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 for me painful for my team agents managers they like, want to make their 10 15 20 percent they and they see an opera a roadmap for right. the future for you and they know too like eventually the music's going to help you know feed this thing and this is going to help feed that thing and like as one area wins the other does uh-huh. but that means that like i have to put tv and film on pause Ooh. for a while especially like immediately after all of this momentum i did a couple like guest spots on some shows and then i hit the road wow and i used the grease momentum for the music and what did you learn during that nine month or year long season? As much as you learn that the industry does get over you, they don't, it doesn't go away. What doesn't go away? Opportunity. Mm. Like so you the were, industry doesn't go away right. and you're, you're conditioned to believe that it will. If I don't do this now, yes. I'll never have this in the no later No is the most powerful word you can you can use. It is just like that is so powerful. Why? Because it just it dictates everything. It dict- it helps you dictate your space, mm-hmm. your place, your time, your energy commitment, all of the things. Because especially as artists, we're givers, we're servers. That's we work in a service industry. Yeah. We grow up based on how I'm like leaning in now. Give it to me, Producers, <laughs> directors, studios, networks. It's been so volatile. It's been so toxic for such a long time because of the conditioning that happens within those systems. And it's, mm. it's that conditioning that is not talked about. If you, it, it's, the, it's the loose, it's the loose like, if you don't, like it could be an issue. We don't, you don't want to look like a diva. You don't uh. want to be, be as compliant as possible. Right, right. It's one of my greatest joys is to have an opportunity to talk to kids, especially in this industry, and be like, y'all, it's you. Mm-hmm. You have to check in with yourself and measure what you're good with and what you're not good with. Right. No one can tell you what that is. No one at all. And your word to use for that is a two-letter one, and it's powerful. Don't let anybody make you feel bad for not saying yes to doing something because it makes you uncomfortable. You say, you know what? That makes me uncomfortable. I'm good. You're not going to be fired. Mm. 
things will get worked out as long as you're respectful. It's just, right. it's the conditioning, man. And it's so exhausting. And I work with adult professionals that have been doing this for many years longer than I have. And I can still see like the emotional damage of conditioning an actor to not be a diva by saying yes and doing everything and being compliant and overworking and mm. getting. What happens when someone uh, abandons themselves and they're, what they really want and says yes to other people out of fear of missing out? I, um, I, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what that is because you just described to me um, depression. Really? And anxiety. When was this? Uh, probably started really ultimately when I was 10 or 11, mm. but didn't actually manifest fully until I was like 20, 24, 23, 24 years old. Five years ago, roughly. Yeah, but roughly five years so it was ago. kind of like low level when you're 11 and then it built. Yeah, more. because I didn't really know what that was. I was always a workaholic and I was always like a go and doer. And yes, so I kept and, busy. Yes, yes, and, yes, and, yes and. and I was energetic. I had the energy at the time yeah. to do it. I was going to do it all. And so I did. And I, and I developed really, really good habits that really hurt me over the years. What good habits hurt you? Horrifically diligent work ethic. Mm -hmm. Meaning that like, I can't stop working. You can't sleep at night until you get uh, it done. Uh, You're, uh, yeah. My brain doesn't stop. I take on everything. I say yes to everything. I jump on other people's things if I feel like they need help. Mm. I pull people's little red wagons. And all of the things that I need to learn, if I'm, especially if I'm gonna be a great producer in film and in television here, I need to learn how to not do. I need to learn how to delegate, delegate more. Empower, to learn how other to empower people. others yeah. to you know give other people opportunities to succeed and do mm -hmm. them. And and so that I have been having the like the time of my life doing that recently. But that's also because I've I've gone through a lot of mental health and emotional things over the last handful of years. But like I'm in the happiest place that I've mm. ever been in my life right now. That's beautiful. You know, and so the reflection's been really great because now I can go back and talk about these things that have gotten me to this point of happiness. I didn't know that I would ever, that I could ever be happier outside of LA mm. because for a long time I believed that the only way that I could work in this industry is by living here. here. Mm. And then when that became so clear that that was not the case and we could go to our happiest place and be with people that matter the most to us, First of all, it's that, it's that healthiest separation of work and, and, and you know, your personal life. Mm -hmm. Like, even when we lived here, lived here for 15 years, I, 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 yeah, I went to the events, I went to the parties from time to time. It was a thick of thing. It was, you know, I, I would leave and go, yeah, I'm going, going, glad I went. It was a good time, mm -hmm. whatever. You don't feel like you're missing out. I don't feel like I'm missing out. And the older I got and the more, like, I was exposed to and around and stuff, I was like, mm -hmm. this is not my shtick at Dude. all. This is not my scene. It's so funny you say that because I'm, I guess it's been 10 years since I moved here, which is crazy to think about. Mm -hmm. um, oh, great shoes. And I remember in the first six months, the first year, sometime in the first year, I got invited to like a Hollywood party in the hills. Yeah. And I remember thinking, oh, what is this all about? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it was the first and last party I ever went to. Really? Yeah. I never went to another party again, mm -hmm. like the typical party. Mm -hmm. I went to in a book launch party or a sure. house party with sure, friends, sure, 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 sure. but not like a party. And There's I remember one party in LA that I'll go to and it's at Notch's house. He's the creator of Minecraft and it's all gamer people yeah. and like, it's fun. oh my God. Yeah, exactly. we have a great yeah, time. Yeah. But this was, I remember just kind of walking around and being like, this is a weird feeling of people that are trying to like, like no one was really connecting. It just smells desperate. It's just like you can taste desperation. And I remember going up to, and I'm not in the industry, right? I'm not an actor, I'm sure. not a writer, I'm not like music, but I'm here in mm -hmm. LA. So I'm adjacent to it, I guess, yeah. with the podcast. Very but much so. Yeah, you work in this industry. I work now. in it, but I'm not in that in that field. In that of, realm, yeah, yeah, I'm God. a different, yeah. I'm a cousin maybe of the industry. <laughs> um, and I remember being like, I need to get some air. So I went to like the yeah. roof of this place. I had a pool and the whole thing in the hills. And the place where I got air away from everyone, there was a few people sitting there. They're like, oh, come on by. And they're doing cocaine. And I go, hmm, this is so, this is very typical. Yeah. You have stereotypical. Very... LA, like, here what? it is. And I just remember being like, like oh. are you doing it because you're in LA at a house party in Beverly Hills yeah. right now? Like, is that why you're doing this? And I remember just thinking, this is not for me, this scene. But I, I found other communities in LA that I really mm -hmm. love that I'm like, 
you know, I never go to parties or bars or anything like that. I yeah. don't drink. I've never been drunk in my life. Oh, um, good for you. So I went. I, I cannot say that. <laughs> but I use, <laughs> I use salsa dancing as my way to go. That's out. your outlet. Yeah. It's like let me listen to music and connect mm-hmm. with people through an expression, not yeah. through that. But um, that's so interesting. So in the last few years. Would you say you were more your darkest time a few years ago then with mental health stuff? Yeah, I mean, no, like, y- 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 yes. On a, let's do this. On a scale of one to ten, uh, where were you with self-love in terms of ten? That's a great question. Being you had amazing inner peace, you mm-hmm. loved and accepted yourself fully, you had no anxiety or stress. Yeah. Uh, and you weren't harmful towards your thoughts, towards yourself. That'd be a, a ten where yeah. you really accept one being you were extremely harmful to yourself mm-hmm. mentally, emotionally. You didn't love and accept yourself. Yeah. Where were you? On the I've only ever center? dipped that low a couple of times, and that only lasts for a minute. Okay. And that's usually that's usually before a big turning point for me, mm-hmm. which is really great. The biggest turning point that I've had in my life, in my life, was learning that I need medication mm. to help me mm-hmm. with this thing that I didn't really know that was afflicting me, I mean, crippling anxiety. When was this? This was months ago. Really? Months ago. So where things, were... things were tackled and because because I, for the first time, because of that, because I hit that one of like, I can't, I was angry with myself for dealing with health issues, for mm-hmm. having like, you know, it was always all those things that led me to, but I have to be here I've got a son coming. I've got all this life to live. I've got to f- get to the bottom of you know. It was my aversion to I, you know, this family stuff, drugs, mm-hmm. alcohol, blah blah blah. I've got some baggage. I was averse to the idea of taking medication, even as a mental health advocate, and would tell other people like, "Oh, medication's great." Blah 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 blah. blah. I couldn't. I I I I I just had such a hard time, not being able to put more stock in my body for taking care of things and then when I was when when that mentality got broken down by somebody going dude there's God Mm -hmm. in this medication like someone miraculously figured out how to create something Mm -hmm. so that people like you and me that deal with I don't create dopamine naturally Mm -hmm. I'm missing a chemical in my brain I don't have to deal with that anymore right Right. And like no, regardless of what you believe, like yeah. God, I know God doesn't want me to suffer. I don't. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to like deal with constantly just being sad no. and having to feign happiness and feign joy and feign like you know being on set and being a leader and being and doing a thing and just being so so horribly sad. Wow, really? How how long for, were you sad for? No, for a long time. Really? I just, dude. Just showed up with a happy face and swept and... all of it away. Interesting. Your your initial question. I'm going to bring it back around to yes. one that you asked a little while ago because I I wanted to get back to it eventually. Was trying to like can we play the tape? It was <laughs> um, it was when did you it was around the mental health self, question or self love? Yes. So one to ten, you said you only got to one a couple times. What were you at? Typically, where you were like a three, a five, yeah. A like six. I think that I think that I I probably baseline for years have just been at a five, a five, yeah, for like five, ten years, kind of middle of the run. But I consider myself to be a happy person. You seem like a happy person. Yeah, but now I know what joy really, truly is. What is it? It well, <laughs> that's a that it can't. There's no sound bite there. <laughs> there's not a sound bite for that. Here's the journey. Let's see if let's just go on the journey with me. I didn't know that I didn't create a chemical in my brain that, cre- that helps with happiness, right? Until when? Until very Recent, recently. Months you know? ago. Yeah, months ago. Okay. I figured out that like, oh, I, I, I need, I have these spikes of anxiety mm-hmm. and all of this stuff. And I'm balancing out now, obviously, therapy and, mm-hmm. and, and all of the things that are going on at home and how excited we are to welcome new life. And, you know, sold Great, a, by the way. thank Congrats, you so man. much, awesome. man. Thank you, thank you. I sold a movie to Netflix and my producerial debut, and it's like it's, it's coming out in, in July, and I'm going to be holding my son and feeding him like at home while we're watching it as a family, Incredible. and like things like that. I'm like, I know, I'm I'm content. Like, I could live these days for the rest of my life, really, and be so happy. 
did you feel like you, you wouldn't have been able to live this way without experiencing the last 15 years? Absolutely not, which is why I love that it all happened. Interesting. I wouldn't take any of it back at all. Any of it. Mm -hmm. Any moment of hurt, heartache, damage, panic attacks, deep depression. I needed all of it, and, mm. and now it's my story. How did you manage the panic or anxiety when it occurred? How would you manage it? Would I mean, there's like all sorts of coping techniques. Do you know, do you know about tapping? Of course, yeah, yeah. EFT. Yeah, big, yeah. big, big, big yeah. fan of that. Um, Neuropathway audio sensory, mm -hmm. putting on headphones and, and playing and playing yeah. certain. Um, there's like you know hour a ten hour long loops online yeah. on YouTube. YouTube is like <laughs> these incredible soundscapes yeah. that are meant to help uh, reconstruct things in the brain and in the body while you're listening. And it's just you know meditation, yoga, exercise. So you had a lot of healthy coping mechanisms. A hundred percent. That's powerful. I re I mean I am a community person. Mm -hmm. I am a physical touch is my number one love language. And if I don't have hugs on a regular basis, I start to wither like a mm. flower. I was mm. just in I was just in Canada for like two weeks by myself. Spent my fourth birthday alone in a hotel room mm. and like. I know about me, my wife knows about me, my friends know about me, my team knows about me, like everyone in my life knows that I need hugs. Mm -hmm. And I got into a really bad habit of not asking for them when I'm lonely, when I'm alone, when I'm by myself. Not intentionally being like, can I have a hug? Right. Like I need, I have a hug quota and I need to meet it. Dude. I'm gonna hug it out even longer now. Yeah. <laughs> Every yeah, time I see you, I'm just gonna squeeze. And I'm like there for it. I'm, that, that's, <laughs> I'm gonna carry my arms. That's when you. I'm happiest. <laughs> yeah. Truly, like I am a human connection person. Yeah. Like that to me. That's why we're here. That's beautiful. Man. Like we're here. We're gonna do whatever we're gonna do mm -hmm. with this life, and it's gonna be great. And whatever the next phase is, is the next phase. When whatever whatever that is for you, and. Mm -hmm. I just want to enjoy it and I want to be happy as much as possible. And so why I say I've kind of been at a baseline five is because I've really worked so hard to, I've just kind of believed that everybody dealt with the same stuff. Mm. And my wife was like, no, Jordan, you've been running a race for the last 20 years Ooh. barefoot up against Usain and, <laughs> and, and, and Rob Johnson uh. and all of these incredible runners and you have been keeping up but they have spikes and you're barefoot. Imagine a world where you have some shoes. Mm. My case is medication, mm -hmm. you know, figuring out what that is for me. Yeah. And I haven't talked about this and I knew that I was gonna talk about this eventually. Like, I even, like, I'm sure Chantal's out there being like, I didn't know that we were gonna talk about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I've just been saying like, it's, yeah. you know, I, I'll, I'll bring it up and discuss it whenever like it feels sure. right. And this, this is the moment where like, I just, I, at the end of the day, if I can remind anyone of anything is that the person that you're looking at or talking to right now is just as complicated as you are and probably mm -hmm. just as damaged as you are and yeah. is fighting and struggling with something of their own, you know, or probably happy about something that they can't talk about or whatever. Mm. You have no clue what that person right. is doing. And so why not just meet them as gently as possible? Mm, absolutely, man. You know, I think we have a lot of, uh, we put a high standard on people. You know, we put a lot of pressure on people to be something sure. without knowing exactly what they're going through. Yeah. Um, even if they look like everything's okay. Yeah. You know, there was a, I think I saw on ESPN a night or two ago about a, a female athlete who committed suicide who was just like won some big award and then a couple weeks later, you know, and one of her teammates said, you never know what people are going through. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you might think everything's okay, but you never know what someone right. might be going through internally. And you right. had... Everything it seemed like for a lot of people that was happening for you in a positive way and incredible talent and opportunities and success. Everything was right on paper. But you're at a five. Yeah. And every, sometimes below. Sometimes below. And I would get angry about that. Like it would make me mad. I was so you like, shame Jordan, yourself. Why? Everything is great. Everything on paper is wonderful. Like this, this I'm in such a good place and space, especially at my age. Like mm -hmm. And the perspective that I have, the goals that I have, like what I'm looking to do, accomplish and do, like Jordan, you and you're loved, you've got people around you, why are you so sad? What was the thoughts that you had about yourself that you would have on a loop or repeat or what would be saying internally? Maybe not to your wife or to friends or family or agents, but inside what were you saying? No one cared. Really? Yeah. I really no one cared about you or your about me as, as a, a human, person. not like your talent as a person. Your... Yeah, I am. Wow, I am. It's interesting. I am 
when, when, I'm trying to figure out how to articulate this without sounding like an absolute douche. But I'm expected to do good work, I think. Like when, when I get brought onto a project or book a project or, 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 or you know, come in creatively to help mm. develop something or build something or produce something, like people just kind of expect for my work to be good. And that's great. I love that there, that's the reputation. Mm -hmm. um, you produce great, consistent work. I do my best too. Yeah. Sometimes it's really, really great, and sometimes it's mediocre, and sometimes you know. But that's that's just part of it. Just mm -hmm. keep writing, just keep building, just keep putting things out, and like that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Life's long, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep on doing it, and and certain things are going to strike oil, and certain things are going to just kind of fall to the wayside, and it is okay. I'm just going to keep on going because I'm going to keep learning and building, and then it's going to be great. But um, yeah, people expect for my work to be good, mm -hmm. and that said. I, did, I, I don't, oddly enough, like, hear from my peers, good job. Really? Very much. Yeah. Um, huh. It's you, mean, a, you mean to you personally, or like they talk about you in this They'll probably world. talk about me in the world, but I think that because people assume that I get it a lot, I actually don't. Wow, Which is man. funny. Wow. And, and I was talking to my, uh, my therapist about this, and they, they hit the nail on the head. They're like... Because they, we, we can find this in anything, in an, any mm. industry, in all industries, like Fortune 500, you know, you're, you're sports, yeah, music, sports, whatever. whatever. Like, if you are expected to do good work and you do good work, nah. you're not if celebrated. You do, yeah. If you do poorly, then people have something to say. Interesting. You know, it's like, wait, what about the other 19 <laughs> times that I did really, really <laughs> crushed, well? Yeah. And you didn't say anything about it. And now you critique this thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, how was that good? For me, mm. no, words of affirmation are, are a big part of my life as well. Uh -huh. I'm a physical touch, quality time, words of affirmation. That's my top three also. Okay, yeah. there it is. Gifts and, and acts of service are kind of like, eh. I it, mean, they're there. They're, it depends. It super depends on what it is and who it's from. Like, I have a, one of my best friends, her, her number one is, is gift giving. But she receives love with quality time. But her number one in terms of giving it is gifts. And it's always stuff that would just blow your mind, make you cry twist you up, turn you upside down. Like it's all, yeah. yeah. And she's apparently done it since she was a kid. Like her parents were like, we don't know how to shop for her. <laughs> and it's Tim the Tap Man's wife too. So like they're fine. Yeah, they yeah. get whatever they want to, you know, like, it, but she's, she's so hard to shop for, for that reason. But so, so See, the, the compliment or the acknowledgement, th that yeah. thing right there, I, I, I started to like, I didn't, again, didn't realize this therapy and this is why everyone needs therapy. You get to work backwards, mm. and it's really wonderful. Dude, how long have you been doing it? Side note, uh, consistently four years since I since I had that really? that that that. Oh, I didn't tell you about the that panic attack. It was like the panic attack that started it all. But that was you know, four years ago. It's four years ago. Yeah, I had, a, I had a, just a really bad moment in a music studio, and and was driving, out. was driving home. The session went great. I was driving home, and I had a red eye that night, and I just like I couldn't. My throat felt like someone was squeezing it. Mm, I've had that feeling freaked so out. many times. I got home, I collapsed on the floor, passed out, like crying, and I woke up with my dog like laid across oh, my man. chest. Yeah. And, and then, my mom like came into my house and because I called her before I got home, I was like, as soon as you can get here, like and so What did you realize in that moment? That I, something was wrong and that I needed a therapist. Wow. That was there was like no question. I was like, I don't I don't know what this is. I don't know, like I'm just it it must be something that you need to process. Something. Yeah, I need to go talk through something. It. Talk through talk through something. What was I know we're on a side note here. I want to get back to what you were saying. But what are the top three biggest things you learned about yourself in the last four years of therapy? I don't give myself grace. Mm -hmm. I give everyone else grace. Ooh. I serve everyone else, but I do not serve myself enough. I've I'm so good at doing for others. And trying my best to not be an inconvenience, but man, I give myself, I gave myself no grace, dude. Such a perfectionist. If things didn't go the way that I needed them to go, the way that I envisioned them going, I would just berate myself. Wow. I would never give myself like the love that, like, ultimately I've needed from peers and from other, you know, coworkers and things like that. I wouldn't even give it to myself. You How can you expect it from others if we're not? If I can't give it to myself, but I was like. How can I even give it to myself? No one else around me. Like, I, yeah, I can't be the only one that thinks that I'm like doing well or anything. Mm -hmm. You know, it just. I think it's also hard to receive love from others if we don't believe that in ourselves that we're absolutely. deserving of it. Absolutely, but we have to go through something to get to that point. Didn't know what that needed to be. Didn't know what that experience was going to be until I started therapy. Right. Yeah. And so, I needed 
to coddle my childhood self. Gosh, man, I'm gonna I'm gonna share with you something real quick. Okay. Why? Side note, because I want to hear this whole thing. I have said this so many times in the last three months on my show, so my my audience is gonna get bored of me saying this. But I've got a photo of my childhood self. Oh my god! On my screensaver, and I've shown this on on camera so many times, so my audience is probably like, "This oh is crazy." God. But for whatever reason, so many people that I have on, we end up talking about inner child healing. Yeah. When I was five, I was sexually abused by a man I didn't know. Oh my God. For 25 years, I didn't tell a soul. Growing up in Ohio, I wasn't, you weren't allowed to express yourself as a, you right. know, as a man in the 80s and 90s growing oh, up course. in the sports. Especially as a guy. And playing sports and things like yeah. this. And I never really dealt with it and faced that until I hit 30 nine years ago. And that allowed me to finally start the healing journey. That's awesome. Right? And my therapist had me do this in the last year. That's been there for a year now. Every two weeks I do therapy because I Great. love emotional accountability. Oh, yeah. To have, to have your person that you can look at and go, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and just yeah. be able to process. Mm -hmm. um, That's incredible. So anyways, I love that you were sharing that. I, I apologize for keep going off here. Yeah, but I love that you felt like you had to coddle your inner child. I had to go, I had to go pick him up wow. and hold him. What did he never have? Let him cry. Um, he started a life of perfectionism at two years old. Gymnastics. Oh man, I can't remember too. That's crazy. My whole life has been about perfection. Mm. I had to be perfect in gymnastics to score well. I had to be perfect in my shows to succeed and and and, and level up, and get better opportunities. I had to be perfect in the audition so that I could book the show. I had to be perfect in my relationship so that I could be perfect in my thing. I'd be perfect in the way that I make this PB and J. I gotta be perfect in the way that I park this car. It just, you see, like, it just got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And and um, that sounds exhausting. Yeah, I um, I didn't give him room to make mistakes. Mm. And now I'm about to have a son mm. and he's not going to take his eyes off me. And I need him to see me make mistakes. Wow. And I need to be able to talk to him about it. And I need to be able to like show him that when I do things that are mediocre, that I'm cool with it and, and you know, build him up for everything. Mm. And when he doesn't do something perfectly, celebrate him for it. I think that's going to be a lot, a lot of my healing. Wow. I think I'm just now. I'm just like coming to this moment, but I do think that that's going to be a lot of my like childhood healing is literally like raising a son. That is powerful. I'm going through my own thing too because, like, you know, obviously, I can't put it all. I, I, I can't put it all on like this thing. Mm -hmm. But I've spent a good amount of time in the last three months, I'd say. Yeah, about three months. I've spent really good time just sitting my childhood self in my lap. God, this is so beautiful, man. I'm giving him a hug. Wow. Checking in, talking. What do you say to him? What do you need? Mm. What did he need? Sometimes it's just that. Sometimes it's just like a moment with family. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just like watching a childhood movie or reading a book. Or sometimes it's picking up the phone and having a conversation with somebody that I haven't spoken to that I miss really badly or, or whatever. It's just sometimes it's just peace and stillness. Yeah. You know? That's beautiful you do that practice. This is a practice I've been doing for the last year and it's been profoundly healing yeah it really as part of the journey right like i literally i envision me like i look yeah. at me me too and and like try to imagine like talking to me as a kid and being like what's up like <laughs> what do you need like yeah, hey I'm here what's up you. hey come Hi. here you know what's up i did a crazy <clears throat> exercise <laughs> we're kind of going there now but yeah. i did a crazy exercise one time after a, a therapy session where <laughs> I laugh sometimes when things get kind of weird. But it's like, it's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm like waiting for like a bomb to be dropped right now. It's not that weird, but okay. it's just, you know, I, I laugh sometimes because I think of myself growing up in Ohio thinking that I would never talk about this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, I have a question for you. Yeah. Can I interrupt you real quick? You can, whatever. Because so you, you obviously, like, you dropped 
that, that information a little while ago uh -huh. on me just now. The natural instinct is to, is to go, I'm so sorry that happened. What's the best thing to hear? I think that's, yeah, that's, that sounds good. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's a good response. I think, um, I think it's a, just an awkward thing to have right, an interaction right. you, around. It's, right, I think right. it's awkward. We met 40 minutes ago, right? It's, like, it's awkward for me to say that, but <clears throat> my audience is used to me opening up in such a vulnerable way that... So is mine. This is my natural come from. I don't yeah, know surface great. level. I can't do the rooftop Hollywood, you know, conversation. It's, <clears throat> that's why we left. <laughs> that's, why, that's why, you know, when, when people come here, that's why I ask you in the beginning before the camera goes, is there anything off limits or... Yeah. Am I allowed to go anywhere to make this the most powerful conversation possible? Because I think this is way more powerful than you saying, uh, you know, whatever surface conversation right. that we could do. Or right. <clears throat> not that it's bad or wrong. It's just not what I'm up to. 100%. It's, for me, it's about deeper levels of humanity. This deeper is the stuff of, that I can talk about for absolutely, forever. Absolutely. Yeah. Me too. And that's why it's like I just get lost in these conversations. I think something that you could say for someone <clears throat> is, I'm so sorry you went through that or... Just be present with them, you know. I think yeah, that's good. You, you know, sometimes when you don't know what to say, it's better to say nothing. But yeah, it, I don't think it's you're wrong either way. Um, but I think good to talk about absolutely good, good, because good, I think it's good to know. awkward for people to to have these conversations, especially yeah. if people don't have the tools to communicate with someone. You know, I feel safe with you, and I feel safe with my audience because I've been talking about it for years. Yeah. I wrote a book about you know how men can heal mm -hmm. from the traumas that they've faced and the masks that they've worn to, pr to protect themselves, yeah, to yeah. defend themselves in society or whatever that have hurt them and hurt more people. Yeah. Um, so this is something I feel comfortable with, but I think um, it, can, it might be a shocker for some if they're you know, just meeting me, but I forget where we're going. Where... You, you, you started laughing and you, I was like, yes. I'm waiting for okay. a bomb so to be bomb, dropped. It's not really a bomb, it's just, I think back to my childhood self and I just think, man, I would never allow myself to talk about these things because it wasn't accepted or cool in school, right? right? But in terms of the having a conversation, like you imagine your childhood self in front of you, you see, you know, little Jordan in front of you and like <laughs> with all the dreams and fears and insecurities and, right. and joy and laughter and this tiny little being growing up, I do the same for myself. And that's why for me, it's on my screensaver. It's, it's, it's here so I can always constantly. remind myself. Like this, like goofy little silly kid, awkward, but man, just filled with a lot of joy, a lot of love. Glow up. A lot of love, a lot of joy. Yes. So I imagine myself, <clears throat> I did an exercise where I was, I was laying down when I did this exercise, but I was had my eyes closed, so I imagined myself standing up and having a conversation and kind of really facing and saying all the things I needed to say to my child, to my little Lewis or inner child mm. at five, six, seven. And I imagined myself there, and then I imagined myself in that position looking up to my now self, my adult self. And are you comforted by that? And I had, yeah, I had a beautiful conversation. I've done That's this great. many times. And, and it's funny because I had Terry Crews on here last week and he talked about, Same thing. he's got a photo of himself when he was a child on his desk and he has conversations. So many men have talked about this now, which is beautiful, I think, to normalize this conversation. That's actually really, really great. And one of the I'm things- I'm changing that, my, my screensaver when we leave. I, it's a beautiful practice. Mm -hmm. And my therapist now is like, okay, we need to work through phase you know, 10 to 12. Yeah. So he's, he's like, find a photo, and I haven't changed it yet. So I'm finding a photo of me at that age to work on that part of my life mm. where I had fears and insecurities and doubts and challenge, heartbreak and all these different That's things. That's really great. So I'm trying That's to. That's such I'm a great to, practice. I'm trying to heal each stage of life where I might have had a wound or a trauma to bring the healing journey all the way up to now. It's amazing. And kind of create that piece there. Um, but the thing that I did was, which I thought was kind of weird. Uh, was after having this kind of interaction and conversation with myself for the first time, this was, long, this was nine months ago, I, t I hugged myself, you know, mentally, and yeah. I felt like my little child was, was right there with me, and I kind of like brought him into my heart, like through my body, into my heart, Ugh. mentally and kind of spiritually, and just connected those moments together. That's amazing. And it was a beautiful... That's a real it moment. Was a, it was a beautiful ritual practice mm -hmm. exercise whatever you want to call it for me at that time because i felt such a disconnection from my right i feel like i had to block so many uh shameful moments mm. right and painful moments i felt like i was 
distant from it. And so now I Whoa. rewrote the story. All of that was just, it was meaning. haunting your yeah, heart. It absolutely. was just, it needed to get cleaned out. Absolutely. And you needed to go through those things to clean those out so yeah. that he had a place to be. Absolutely. That's, and he felt safe. Amazing. And now there's an adult in the room, you know, and it's like there's healing and there's mm-hmm. context and there's meaning from that. Anyways, I'm going off topic here, but so you were mentioning at one point about perfectionism, of how, about everything had to be perfect. Yeah. When did you realize that that was part of the problem? Because mm. in some ways, it drove you to probably creating results and opportunities and... Definitely, because reputation of a really good hard worker, mm-hmm. kind to people on set, and within, in and around the industry. Um, I think that, that started to break when I started needing to tell people. I'm like the friend therapist, right? Like, I'm always like the, the person people want to talk to. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, I'd love to. Like, let's talk uh-huh. about it. I'm not a mental health professional. <laughs> right. So I'd love to talk to you, but like, I'm probably always going to end the conversation with. Talk to a therapist or. Have you thought about like maybe meeting with me? <laughs> Because yeah. I'm always going to. I, mean, I think course. everyone needs one. I think Absolutely, that everyone man. needs it. Yeah. So um, it probably started to break for me when I when I really started finding myself needing to tell people like, "Oh, you're an idiot. Like, mm. no one's perfect. Mm. Why would you put so much pressure on yourself to do that? Like, it's okay. People make mistakes. Mm-hmm. So you were saying this to other people, <laughs> and then I. At some point in time, I mean, I think it was, yeah, like six months ago, I started just going, it's fine. Mm. It's okay. Not it? not that like me, me condoning mediocrity is sure, like sure. the thing, but. Giving it your best and being okay with that. And if I screw mm. up, because if, if someone else makes a mistake, I'm always like, okay. But when you made mistakes, okay. what happened? I'm like, how in the world? Could I have done that? And I think... But people it probably isn't a mistake to other people. And I think that everyone else is like, oh, oh Jordan. Oh. Because of the, again, we go backwards. I don't, that's what I'm used to hear. Like, if I do well, I don't hear that I do Interesting. well. Interesting. As much as I, like, when I don't do well. If I was getting mm-hmm. notes for a show or notes for a, you know, feedback from an audition or whatever the case may be. Mm. Um, wow, man. Interesting. And it didn't happen overnight, right? So like yes. the reparation it's still also is not going to yeah. happen overnight. Like, yeah, it's going to take time. You know, if it's 15 years of damage, then it's 15 years of Well, hopefully, healing. hopefully, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Short the time. It doesn't have to be hopefully, that long. Yeah. Hopefully. But my therapist says uh, healing is not an event. It's a journey. It is, you know, yeah. it's a moment of realization, uh-huh. awareness, and then it's a learning process mm-hmm. of, of healing. And then, Hopefully it eventually soothes to going away, but it may be a, a journey forever yeah. or something, but not as painful, hopefully. Hopefully. So you you have a son who's gonna be... Uh, born. <sighs> that was crazy <laughs> just now. That made my hand sweat. Bro, that was awesome to hear. Why? That was just so cool. All right, so you have a son that it was so normal. That was incredible. Oh, it's so cool. It's still so fresh. It's crazy, uh, huh? Yeah. Your son's gonna be coming in a few months. In a few months, yeah. You're gonna be a father. Seven weeks, yeah. I'll be a father. Wow. I'll be dad. On it? Father's Day. Holy cow. Which is also Juneteenth. <laughs> Just layers to yeah. this. How does that make you feel knowing you're gonna be a dad? It's my it's what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm. It's the reason why I'm here. That's really? the reason why I'm on earth, is to be a dad. How do you sure. know, how do you know that? Because have you have you read Matthew McConaughey's book? I had him on. I mean, yeah. I, I interviewed him for it, but yeah. Okay. So did, did he tell you about his his childhood and, and how he looked at his father? and, and Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Me. Yeah. <laughs> like, the adoption portion of my story is probably part of it, but my parents gave me an amazing example of what, like, what genuine love is, what true mm. love is. They had really, really bad first marriages. They found each other in their late 20s. Um, you know, the, their oldest had me when she was 16. I was immediately adopted. The older three was, were just my big sisters and brother. And I knew that Felicia gave birth to me, but like I also, you know, my mom and my dad were mm-hmm. my mom and my dad, Pat and Ronnie. Um, oh, God, 
God, dude, my, my brain is just all over the place. I lost my Fatherhood. Train of thought. Fatherhood, thank you. Why do you feel like you were they meant to be? They showed me what like comfort and safety and love and a home is, and they were happy. Mm-hmm. And we laughed and giggled and watched friends at the coffee table while we mm-hmm. eat dinner every night. And you know, we'd go to Blockbuster on Fridays and like go to the park and mm-hmm. Everything was intentional, and, and 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 they raised me with respect, and they showed me how to be respectful, but also like lead and to guide and to mm. do. And I looked at my dad and went like, "That that's a man who has a partner that he loves more than anything, mm. and that works his butt off to make sure that we all have a good, happy, healthy life." So does my mom, you know, working mom. Like they they work so hard. To make sure that when we all get home at the end of the day, we're happy, we have what we mm. need, you know, that's we have each other, because that's our sanctuary. We all go off yeah. and we do our adventures during the day, and then we go, oh, how was your day? Mm, was you beautiful. know what I mean? Like, that's, that is what it's about. Like, that is life to that's, me, that's personally. Yeah. And so, all that said, everything that has, like, prepped me for this has uh-huh. prepped me to have that dynamic, to have that to create that home environment that I got to grow up in. That's I was beautiful. one of the lucky ones in my family that I got to grow up in that warm, safe place. Like I get to make that mm. with the person that I love more than anything. Like, That's so cool, man. When you have that, when you have your partner, you have that kind of commitment and history. We, you know, we met when we were nine and 13 years old. So we were friends growing up and have so much time and so many adventures and different you know, we've had so many different relationships that led up to, you know, her coming to see me do a show in New York and us getting dinner to us now being married for a couple of years and having mm. a kid on the way and more coming. I mean, like I, my dream for as long as I can remember is to be able to go to my own home with my own wife, with my own kids. That's so cool. That's always what I've wanted. That's so cool, man. I can't wait to have like the team jersey that I wear when I make all of the <laughs> breakfast burritos to take to my... To, to my kid's baseball practice. I can't mm. wait to like do her hair for her recital. I can't wait to like pick somebody up from their first date. Mm. I can't wait to like meet the first boyfriend even though it's gonna, I'm gonna hate it. <laughs> and I can't, but I can't wait for these mm. life things to happen because mm. like to me, that's where all like the real big awesome joy is. That's cool, man. And then everything else is just, it's my work and I love it. I love my jobs. But I live, I, I work to live. Mm-hmm. I live my life. Is there a song that you like recently that really speaks to your heart through what you've experienced in the last few years that maybe you listen to or you sing just when you're humming something that, that has a line or a lyric or a chorus that you're like, man, this is a powerful you thing know, for man, me. You know, man, probably, but off the top of my head right Nothing. now, no, not yeah. so much. I mean, I... I'd love to give that to you later. You know, like yeah, can, yeah. You know, Next time. I'll hit you. Next like, time. By the way, here's that Here line. Here it is. Yeah, we can yeah. talk about it again. Um, yeah, there's so much music. I mean, and that's the other thing, too, is like, if there isn't a line, like, I'm going to write it for one of my songs mm. that then I can't say. Because, you know, song. But, um, yeah, there, I, I think of so many artists mm. probably is where I go first of, like, who speaks to me the most, you know? Who is that? Matt Healy from the 1975, the lead singer of the 1975. He's probably the smartest songwriter of our generation. Okay. Um, I gotta say, man, That's Just the Way It Is by Bruce Hornsby is one of the most slice of life records. A lot of people love the Tupac version. The Tupac version is great. Change is awesome. Yeah. But frankly, that whole song, that whole song is just like a man... That's life, huh? Mm-hmm. And it really sucks, huh? It's perspective. It's a perspective mm-hmm. song that I think is a very important one for people to like, especially kids, to know kind of yeah. early on when they start to like experience boredom as a kid, you know? Boredom is the gateway to mundane. Mm-hmm. And they're gonna experience that at some point in time in their lives. Right. We all go through a mundane mm-hmm. point in our lives and sure. kids experience boredom and it's the like the world's gonna explode. Mm-hmm. I am going to die. If I don't find entertainment immediately, it's like, woo, <laughs> that's just the way it is. Yeah. <laughs> Some things will never change. <laughs> like it's that. 
But it, it goes deeper, obviously. I mean, sure. we talked about everything from racism to work ethic to mm-hmm. all all sorts of things in that song. Yeah. But that's a that's a big like just. <laughs> He literally ends the song, the the way his last lyrics are, that's just the way, the way, the way, the way it is. And it goes into this gorgeous Mm. piano, you know, solo. Yeah. And to me, the the expression of that musically is is saying that, like, even though that's just the way it is, it doesn't mean that this can't be fun. Mm -hmm. I've got three final questions for you to respect your time. Before I get to them, I want people to follow you. You're everywhere. You've got... Music, art, dance, gaming, you're all over the place on yeah. so many different things. You speak like 37 languages. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't, don't know how you I'm find the time lot. I'm not, for all these things. I would things. like to be. Right. That'd, that'd, be, that'd be one of my three wishes. Um, Jordan Fisher everywhere. Yeah. Um, and also, you've got a new film that you produced. Yeah, yeah. And that's coming out soon. It's got a long title. Hello, <laughs> goodbye, and everything in between. But we mean that. It's kind of just like the way it is. I mean that, yeah. It's no, it's, it's really great. And this was a really good piece too. I mean, like the, this, the stuff that I'm attaching my name to as a producer and, 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 and digging into building things are all things that, um, you know, I think that culturally we need to be talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, I, this script resonated a lot with me because, not because of uh, the character I play, Aiden, but because of Claire, the, the, the girl that Talia plays. I find a lot of my unhealthy planner, perfectionist, mm. type A things that come, that, that, that just kind of swirl around in here. They yeah. just kind of swirl. They don't really pop up as much anymore because right. I've gotten really good at like just letting them swirl and being uh-huh. like, yo, chill. And they'll right. just kind of, it'll, it'll, it'll taper. But um, her perfectionism definitely was one. It, it, it really, I mean, the synopsis of the film our characters, Claire and Aiden, they 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 you know fall in love their senior year, but they ultimately decide that that before they go into the relationship, that it's you know they don't want to go to college in a relationship. They've heard from so many people, yeah. it's not the move. I did that. I ended a relationship. Yeah, and the last year of high school, and I kind of regretted it. Really, I later regretted it. It was the right move, but yeah. I was afraid to lose it after right. a while. And yeah, anyways. Well, then I think. There's something to be said about both sides, right? right? There's something to be said about like ending the relationship so you can go and have a fresh start, fresh, you know, clean yeah. slate, whatever. And then there's something about not and it, and it it working out. You know what I mean? Like, sure. Ellie was in college when we were dating, and that was granted. It was different. We had the means. We could travel. We could see. Mm-hmm. She joined me on tour for a while. Like it was a different. It was sure, you know. Sure. It was, it's it's not <laughs> not a you totally fair to picture. But we, we put forth the effort. We of did. Course. We put forth the effort to make that happen. And, um, yeah, it's a matter of figuring out just like what's the right move and what, how do we know what the mm-hmm. right move is mm-hmm. and, and, and that journey. So it's, it's, yeah. it's interesting because it's a YA rom-com and I was like, I'm done with YA rom-coms, mm-hmm. I think, but this one doesn't feel like that. This one's very, it's slice of life, but man, it's, 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 it challenges a lot of relationship-oriented things for everyone. Everyone, That's really. exciting, man. It's in, it's in July, it's out, right? Yeah, July 6th on July. Netflix. Netflix. I'll be watching, I'll be sharing it. I want Thank everyone you. to watch it too. Make sure to tag you yeah. all over social media when you're watching it. So where do you spend the most time right now on social media? Where? Twitter and Twitter and Twitch. Twitter and Twitch. Twitter and Twitch. Double T. Double T. All right. Twitter Double and T. Twitch. I stream pretty much every day. That's cool. On Twitch. Um, I've Twitch never dot... gotten into it. I know I you used to game to. as a kid, but you're gonna go like... you're gonna go to twitch.tv. Okay. Uh-huh. Hope everyone's listening. Forward slash Jordan. Fisher. Yes, I got that idea. Yep. You're gonna follow. Uh huh. You're gonna ring the little bell so you get a notification, notification when every I go time live. you go live. It's right there. That's right. Ring the little bell, and um, you you will be. If you say, "Hey, met Jordan IRL, and he sent me here," you will be welcome. That's kind of like the mm. speakeasy password. Ooh. Like if I met Jordan IRL and he told me to come here, you will be so warmly welcomed and celebrated by like a few thousand of your new best friends. That's awesome. And it's just love. It feels like a family. That's great, man. That's it's awesome. I'm excited for you for all the things. Thank and you so and much, if, you, if people follow you everywhere, then they'll see these announcements as well and they can stay up to date on all of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a question I ask everyone at the end. It's called the three truths okay. question. Okay. Hypothetical scenario. Okay. You live as long as you want, mm-hmm. but eventually it's your last day on earth. Okay. You accomplish everything, you live the family life, you enjoy the moments, whatever you wanna do, you get to create and manifest it, it all happens. 
But for whatever reason, in this hypothetical scenario, you've got to take all of your work and message with you or go somewhere else. All of your music, videos, Twitch streaming, this content, whatever you create in the future, for whatever reason, it's not here. Hypothetical. Mm. But you get to leave behind three lessons that you feel like you've learned and three lessons that you would share. And we don't have what anything. a prompt. And we don't have any other content or, or information that is accessible that you've shared before. But these three things you get to share, they can be simple, profound, anything in between. I call it the three truths. What would you say to yours? It. I love it so much. This is one of my favorite questions that I've ever been asked in my life. I'm happy to this hear is, that. What an incredible, like I have to slow clap for you, like truly. <laughs> Like, you know, you get prompted some questions from time to time, but like the way that you set that up mm. and then gave me, the, like it really it gave, it, it's, it's finite. Mm -hmm. This is all we have to remember. It's going to be concise, sweet, and simple. Give it to me. Number one, always treat people with kindness mm. first, period. Mm. Period. Because you don't know if, well, this is not as concise. You don't know if you are the last person that they speak to. Ooh. You don't know if you're the last straw on the camel's back that made that comment to them that was just a passing moment for you, but the thing that drove them mm. to do something horrible. Mm. You just don't know yeah. ever. In the same way that they don't know. And you would probably like for people to know when you're feeling not great or in a bad mood, but you're not going to tell people, but you kind of like for them to just kind of know so that they can comfort you and whatnot. Let's just eliminate all of the other, mm -hmm. bleep me out, and just start with kindness. Yeah, yeah. beautiful, man. Um, please wear your heart on your sleeve. Mm. Always wear your heart on your sleeve. Tell people how you feel about things. I was talking to my niece today, who literally texted me out of the blue. She said, Jordan, thank you for making it so easy to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Randomly out of the blue, I can show you on my phone. I was like, oh, and it's, it's very, it's, it, it's very much that it's, I, I, I was like, if, you know, if you can promise to just wear your heart on your sleeve and express how you feel about things, tell people, she was like, she, she said in the text message, she's like, you know, I have such a hard time with opening up and talking about things that really bother me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I just, I, was, I, I didn't say, I need you to promise me something. I was like, can you do me a favor? Next time I ask you how your day was, I want you to pause and I want you to check in on your heart and your soul and I want to make sure that you are not lying to make things better than they sure, are. Sure, sure. I'm asking you, my niece, how are you today? And I would like to know that I'm going to get the honest answer. Mm -hmm. Because when you ask me, you know how sometimes I just like, I tell you things that are just like TMI, mm -hmm. how like... Oh yeah, and then I, yeah, I felt a little like, blah, 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 and I got a little like anxiety or whatever, but like, you know, ultimately it worked out and like, you know, here we are today. How about you? Oh yeah, I'm good. I had a good day. It's not fair mm -hmm. to you, to me. Mm -hmm. Like we need to, we need to be, make it normal. Like yeah. just normalize like the, how are you? Good. No, I don't do that anymore. Right. I don't do that anymore. How are you? Good. 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 <laughs> yeah. That's always gonna be the answer. How you doing? I'm good. What's the point of asking someone how they're doing? Mm -hmm. What should that be? Let's talk about that for a second. What should mm -hmm. that be? Like, how are you? Mm -hmm. Like, how was your day today? That's a good one. Mm -hmm. When I'm in depression, like when I'm at my worst, I'm, you know, People that love me want to know how I'm doing. Right. Not you know? a surface answer. Right. Yeah. Like, how are you feeling today? Like, are, you, are you feeling good? Like, that's, that's, that's usually the thing. It's like, I, it's moment to moment. Something I like to ask people, uh, and I get caught up with saying, hey, how's it going? How's, how are you doing today? What I like to ask people and, and be intentional about is, what are you most grateful for mm. today? Mm -hmm. And what's your biggest challenge you're, you're going through today? That's good. And I think that it gives people the oh, opportunity really to respond with perspective on both sides. I'm really grateful for being here or my health or I had this conversation or I'm excited about this thing. Mm. And I'm also 
my challenge is this right now. So it allows the conversation to open up into, and maybe there's no challenge. I'm adopting that. Maybe there's no challenge. Maybe, maybe it's yeah. just all the gratitude. And, and that's great. And we can talk yeah. about that. Then. Yeah, exactly. We can talk about that. Then. So what are you most grateful for today or excited about? And what are you challenged? What's gonna, your challenge? I'm going to use that every day. Take it. I'm going to take like, it. That Love is it. one of my favorite Try it on. I've heard in a minute. Minimum. Try it on. I will. Okay. So number, so number three. Yeah. So so we're gonna we're gonna always treat people with kindness first. Yep. We're gonna wear, wear your heart on our sleeve. sleeve. Yep. Yeah. We're gonna talk about our feelings. Mm -hmm. um, number three. Hmm. It's always the trickiest one. Right? Like you know, <laughs> you wish for more wishes. Uh. <laughs> um, number three. Don't forget to play. Mm, man, that's. I stopped playing. I stopped playing when I was like in my early twenties and too mm. big for my britches and finding autonomy and starting to find success in my work and industry and everything. Took took myself way too seriously. Um, needed to have a certain bravado and air for people to like know that I was good at what I did and respect, like, respect and, me yeah. and like successful and all that stuff. I needed to know that I was the most successful person in the room and the hardest working person in the room and I needed to know that everybody knew that. Mm. Like it's being a three, dude. It's the three on the Enneagram scale with the toxic pairing of being a two as well. So all You're of that- a three, two what? I'm a three, two. So okay. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a three with a two wing. Okay, yeah. And what's so, the third one? Oh, hmm. like so, so I guess- it would make it like the other side of it. Like when mm -hmm. I'm at my unhealthiest, I don't remember what that is. Yeah, gotcha, like, I'd have gotcha, to look at the chart gotcha. because You're I don't a two, what three. that is. But I'm a, I'm a three, two. Three, two. I think yeah. I'm a, because two is what the. Uh, Two's the servant. So I think I'm a. Two's the helper. Yeah, I can't remember. I'm a two, three, 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 seven, I think, or two, seven, three or something like that. Yeah. I, yeah. So like your main and then your wing is yeah. like, like, this is what you have. And this is like your, your other tendencies. Yeah. And, and three is the performer. The doer, the mm. I think I'm two, three, yeah. seven. I think. Helper. Yeah, yeah. I can, I can, I get uh, that. From you. Yeah, yeah. I definitely get like the two from you. Your <laughs> servant's heart. You have yeah, a real like. I want to give and be of service. Yeah. It's my mission. It's a beautiful disposition. Yeah. And, and you got to make sure you're not abandoning yourself in the service of. Man, you oh understand. man, you're talking to the guy. <laughs> huh? You got to make sure you don't leave him like in the corner exactly. in the fetal position. Yeah, like that's. Man. I genuinely, I would, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. We're going back to it, but like I, could, I would imagine like little me in the mm -hmm. corner crying and mm -hmm. like. It's the most devastating thing in the world. Yeah, it's the beginning of that healing is really good. But yeah, Absolutely, don't forget man. to play. I, I, I I'm having a kid. I've got a lot of little ones in my life. Ooh. Got kids and nieces and nephews and stuff. And when I'm in town, when Aunt Ellie and Uncle Jordan are in town, we are so fun. <laughs> we have such a good time. That's great. You know, like we're like the hey, let's snuggle, watch movies, eat food, uh -huh. all that good stuff. But like they eventually want to go jump on the trampoline and all that stuff. That's and fun. I got to that. I got in the bad habit. Just gymnast. My body hurts. You know, like. I got into the habit of like, oh, if I don't need to expend this energy, I'm, I'm gonna save relax. It. I'm gonna relax. I'm yeah. gonna save it so that I can like use it to work sure, and like do what sure. I need to get done. But the bottom line is like, they're gonna not. They're gonna stop asking me to play if you don't. If you keep saying no, and then eventually they're gonna not want to at all anymore. Right, right. Like even if I did, mm -hmm. I'm every time I say I'm no, I'm no, mm -hmm. I'm, oh, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> I'm, I'm losing that opportunity when they came to me mm -hmm. and asked for me to play with them, to mm -hmm. go jump on the trampoline yeah. and not just like sit with a cup of coffee on the porch and watch <laughs> from the backyard with Damn. a glass of wine with the rest of the parents and watch because like, I genuinely meant like, I have more fun watching. I, like, yeah, I mean that, like I have so much fun because you guys can go and do and stuff, but like, no, when you're there. They'll remember that more than anything. It means a lot to them. Yeah. Don't forget to play. And that that's not just for like the dad talk. It's not just that. It's the, life, man. Life. When you're making music, when you're writing your dissertation, Everything. when you're in the lab, when you're on the court. Have fun. Don't forget to play. Jordan, I've got one final question before yeah. I ask you, Jordan. I want to acknowledge you. Um, I'm a big believer in acknowledging the people in our lives consistently. So acknowledgement is something I do with every episode. Great. And I know I, you wanted acknowledgement in certain ways from your, your craft and just as a human being with peers and things like that. And it sounded like you didn't get that often unless you had an off night, which was probably yeah. the greatest performance most people would ever have, but you had a little off night. You were a nine out of 10, maybe, yeah. not a 12 out of 10. So I want to acknowledge you, Jordan, for the journey you've been on, for healing and being on the healing journey, for allowing yourself grace, for letting go of the perfectionist inside of you from young years to now for making your mission about being the best father and partner and friend you can be 
not the best success you can be. I think it's really inspiring to see someone your age with your amount of success, where you've come from, have that mission, especially growing up in the Hollywood world. So I really acknowledge you for your heart, for your energy and your presence. And um, I hope we can Thank do you, more of this in the future. Yeah, you're, you're just a joy. I appreciate it. can't man. wait for the next one. I appreciate it. We're going to have many, many rounds after this. Um, my, my final question is, what's your definition of greatness? Transparency, I think. Mm -hmm. I think, that the, I think that the most successful, great, outstanding, respected people, genuinely, the mo like the biggest change makers are the ones that are most transparent, mm. the most real, the most honest. That's my path to greatness, is just being transparent. Mm. Jordan, appreciate it, man. Appreciate, appreciate you, too. Much love to you. Look, I went through years of really struggling. It, I was having a great sort of part of my life in social media and speaking gigs and writing this book for three years. And then, but I was not really working as an actor. And that was so ego deflating. Really? It was th this thing that I'd done since I was nine.